Resilience 21 Coalition town <clears throat> evening. Uh, we have a packed agenda, so we're, we're trying to start on time, and, and I'm here to really help keep this moving. Um, I am one of the Resilience 21 co-facilitators, along with uh, my friend Laurie Schumann, who you hear from in a minute, and uh, Aho, who I believe is on the call tonight for part of it. Um, I just want to quickly note that as the uh, host at Resilient Cities Network and Global Director for Policy and Investments, these are the kind of big tent uh, gatherings that we try to do and bring our partners and co-conveners together and make sure that we're hearing uh, a range of voices, um, including from the federal government as these kinds of um, uh, policies um, and, and bills come through, um, whatever their path might be. So tonight is a great example of where um, Resilience 21 is just a host as we have been, as we've been trying to push these resilience policy efforts forward. And um, the, that is our role, that is my role tonight. Um, again, if you don't know me, um, a lot of people are still piling in here. I'm Stuart sarkozy Bonacy, and I'm with Resilience Cities Network <clears throat> and one of the co-facilitators for Resilience 21. Um, I really wanna thank our co-conveners because this is the kind of uh, giant group hug around resilience that we wanna do and keep the, 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 these kinds of bipartisan efforts moving forward. Um, huge thanks to Union of Concerned Scientists, to uh, ASAP, to the <coughs> American Society of Ad Adaptation Professionals. Proud to be a member. Go ASAP. Um, and um, also to my our, our, our behind the scenes team with Enterprise who've been helping um, all along. And uh, finally to the Pew Charitable Trusts who have um, been doing a lot of work on the ground um, around this legislation as well. Um, and also, I would be remiss if I did not thank our respondents who come at this from various different angles. I'm really glad that uh, Jay Begay, who sits on the Resilience 21 Leadership Circle and is the Climate Justice Lead for Indian Collective, is with us tonight. Um, also, um, uh, Kyle Spencer, who's the Chief Resilience Officer for Norfolk um, in Virginia. Obviously, a lot uh, in his space um, that we're working with that this kind of legislation um, reinforces. Um, and we have Tom Santos from Zurich, Zurich North America, um, and they've been an amazing partner on some of our work globally, as well as on the ground in the US, um, and helping seed our Resilient Community Impact Fund. So um, thanks to all of them for making this happen and our co-conveners. Um, just those usual housekeeping, we've all been doing this a long time, um, especially during the Q&A, keep your cameras on and the mic's off, uh, the mic's muted. Um, use your hand to raise, uh, your hand raise function if we, you have a question during the Q&A. We have two sections of Q&A that we're gonna try to do right after our speakers um, who will be introduced. Um, don't, don't think I forgot them. Um, they're gonna be introduced by um, Mahir and Lori. Um, and um, if there's time, we will maybe doing some Q&A stuff right in the, in the chat because we always run out of time, no matter how long we schedule these things. So um, I am now gonna turn it over to Lori Schumann from Enterprise, uh, who has a few words and then she'll give it to me here and we will get this uh, underway. Thanks to everyone. Thank you so much, Stuart. It's wonderful to be with everyone today. We are so grateful for our partners, Pew and ASAP. And I wanted to just say a few things uh, to kind of frame out our discussion tonight, which is basically this. Uh, we know that the world is changing, that climate is changing, that there are natural hazards that are occurring and emerging that uh, we've never experienced before. And it's costing our nation a lot of money. And it's costing taxpayers and lives and communities a lot of resources. We are really excited about today's conversation to talk about how can we be more effective and united in partnership with one another uh, to collaborate to build a strong nation. Energy and transportation. It's about also collaboration. Uh, it's about supporting one another. It's about bipartisan. And it's about Unity. And others so I am really happy to turn over to me here. Sorry, Josh. Josh, can you keep yourself muted? Um, um, 
it's also really noteful that we have Zurich with us because one of the issues that we're facing in the country is the rising cost of insurance and insurance disappearing. So tonight is about unity. Tonight is about bipartisanship. R21, that's our motto. That's why we exist, to facilitate and platform a united nation and a nation of resilient communities. Um, so here, take it away. Thanks, Lori. Uh, before I go on, can I just ask everyone to please put themselves on mute? Just getting some some feedback. Uh, so if everyone could just put themselves on mute, please. Appreciate it. Um, thanks so much, Stuart and Lori. So excited to be here with R21 and uh, to cover our, our call to action today on the National Climate Adaptation and Resilience Strategy Act, or NCARS. Um, we're going to hear from from two uh, two of the uh, one, one of the co-sponsors of this bill and um, from an, another supporter in in Congress. But um, just want to basically say that NCARS, long and short of it, will require the federal government to produce a national climate adaptation and resilience strategy, as well as create the position of uh, chief resilience officer for the country. So. Um, on behalf of R21 and all of our co-conveners, we're really excited to learn more about the, the bill today and um, to hear more about how we can support it. So just some kind of three high-level objectives that we're here to talk about today. Inform, so what is NCARS and why is it important? Engage, how do we bring together all of you here on the call today with policymakers, key practitioners to discuss the bill and um, basically to support through grassroots support, provide NCARS through grassroots support. Um, and then to act, this call to action is targeted to individuals as well as organizational and corporate uh, corporations to support the NCARS bill um, for potential co-sponsors, as well as just general support um, for the bill itself from grassroots efforts, which we'll go into a little bit later. Um, before I introduce our, our two first speakers from the congressional offices, just want to give a, uh, a shout out to Cameron Adams, who, while he was a NOS uh, fellow and policy aide with Senator Coons's office, was uh, really the key author of this bill. So just want to applaud you, Cam, for all the work that you've done on this. Um, you've spoken and worked with so many folks on this call to really get this thing to where it is. So just want to appreciate and acknowledge you. Thanks again. Uh, with that, I want to I want to introduce um, from Senator Kunz's office, Chris Sevilla, and then from Representative Maria Alviria Salazar's office, uh, representing Florida's 27th district, John Mark Klob to uh, call, excuse me, to uh, to just give us a little bit of education hey. on the bill itself. I have to go downstairs and finish my work call. All right, thank you, thank you so much. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a real you know organizing call if there weren't some Zoom chaos. So uh, it feels feels really authentic in that way. Um, thank you all so much for for being on with us after work hours on this Thursday. Um, I've just got a few thank yous that I got to do, and then we'll get to the meet. Just thank you so much to the R21 network uh, and all the co-conveners. Special shout outs to uh, Mahir and to Forbes who have helped me so much uh, week after week with this bill over the last few months. Thank you to John Mark for being a great bipartisan co-sponsor at the staff level here on the Hill. And thank you so, so much to Cam Adams, who has already gotten a shout out. And I, and I hope he gets a few more as, as really uh, the man who spent uh, many months, many hours um, doing a lot of the drafting of this bill. So thanks so much, Cam. It's been, it's been really fun to carry this bill forward after your fellowship ended. Um, so this call is, is not about the details of the National Climate Adaptation Resilience Strategy. Act. We can talk about that sometime. I will give four top lines of what it's going to do, but this call is about a call to action and how we can get it passed, hopefully, this Congress. So just as, as motivation, this bill would require the production of a whole of government um, adaptation resilience strategy and implementation plan, would authorize a chief resilience officer position in the White House, it would establish several interagency resilience working groups and one federal uh, non-federal partners council, which includes partners from the private sector, from the nonprofit sector, from state and local governments, and from affected communities. And most importantly, this bill would drive efficient and equitable resilience solutions. Enough, enough of the policy wonky details. Let's talk about how we get this thing done this Congress this year. Um, so it's a call to action. I'm very curious to hear your Q&A once we get there. I'm only going to talk for a few more minutes. John Mark's got a four or five minutes of remarks, but we need you to call. We need you to write. We need you to meet with your members of Congress and their staffs uh, in the next few months, um, whether that's on Zoom or if you have the, the capacity to get here and, and, and do some of those meetings in person. 
um, that would be great. Um, on my side in the Senate, we have an avenue here uh, to include NCARS in the National Defense Authorization Act um, as an amendment, which is you know, going to require some legislative maneuvering. That's mostly my job to figure out. Um, and how, how you all can be the most helpful uh, in doing that is make sure that your senators from the states that you live in support this bill. And I'm just going to go and rattle off a long list <laughs> of last names. These are the senators that are going to be the most important, that we are the most um, targeted on making sure that if, as it would be great if they support and come on as a co-sponsor, but at least they hear from folks in their states that they should not oppose this bill. Um, so I'm just going to rattle off a long list of names. And if, if one of these is, is a senator from your state or someone who, uh, through some professional connection, uh, you, you could have any, any influence with, uh, just, just make a note. And then John, Mark, and I will, will be happy in the Q&A to answer any questions that you guys have about how best to approach members and their staff. Um, so this is just a long list um, of names and, and just bear with me. Okay, so on the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, on the majority side, we have Peters, Carper, Hassan, Cinema. Rosen, Padilla, and Ossoff. And then most importantly on the minority side, Portman, Johnson, Paul, Lankford, Romney, Scott, and Hawley. And then on the Senate Armed Services Committee side, uh, who are the folks who put together the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, on the minority side, we have Inhofe, Wicker, Fisher, Cotton, Rounds, Ernst, Tillis, Sullivan, Kramer, Scott, Blackburn, Hawley, and Tupperville. So those are that, that long, long list of names. Those are the key senators. But we need to make sure that their staffs and them understand that this is a bill that will so greatly help their home states. Um, and due to the committees that they sit on, they're the folks who we need to make sure um, if, if they don't support, they at least don't have any objections. Uh, because we've got a few months here where hopefully we can get this bill passed. Um, so enough of those details. I'll kick it over to John Mark, who's got some remarks prepared, and then we'll we'll both stick around for fifteen or twenty minutes and answer all the questions that you guys have. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate um, your leadership and, and leadership of Senator Coons on this, who's been a champion in the Senate. Um, and thanks R twenty one for the opportunity and just you know to, the opportunity to speak directly to everyone. And thank you for what you're doing. This is really important. Uh, my boss Maria Salazar represents Florida's twenty seventh district, which is in Miami. Miami is ground zero for climate change and especially sea level rise. Um, so in Miami, we know the sea level, the sea is rising and everything we do matters. Um, and resiliency is really important. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just take a few minutes to talk about, you know, some broad generalizations of how do we get Republicans to support this, right? This is a bipartisan bill. It should be, and this is something that should pass Congress despite the fact that everything in Congress is politicized and there's always, you know, two sides of talking about an issue. So I'm gonna try to attempt to say what I think Republicans will be receptive of and how um, you all in your lobbying and engagement efforts um, at, at federal, state and local level um, can actually talk to this issue in, in a good way. Um, so that being said, um, I think how we talk about this really matters. Um, resiliency is obviously important and I do believe Republicans care. Um, this bill hits a few things that I think Republicans really care about. Um, you know, when it sets a strategy, you know, um, a lot of Republicans like to know if, if the federal government is doing something, you know, like have a plan and stick to the plan. Um, another thing great about in cars is it streamlines what the government's doing. So right now we have several different agencies that are working on resilience policy and a lot of them are not talking to each other. Um, so this is going to have everyone in the same room. It's going to promote, you know, streamlining and government efficiency and Republicans like government efficiency. Um, and number three, it invests in the future. You know, um, you know, if we're going to spend federal dollars, we want to be spending them in a responsible way. Um, you know, one, one stat, I like this changes all the time, but I think the, the latest update is for every dollar that FEMA spends in resilience and mitigation, you know, we save six dollars on the back end from having to do a disaster supplemental in Congress and come back and, and fund something after disasters happened. Um, so framing it that way of, hey, this is uh, going to promote government efficiency. It's going to give us a clear plan and it's going to help us invest in our future, I think is really critical. And on top of that, I think, um, you know, for your purposes, as as 
you're able to do research, um, you know, target to your member and your staffers. Um, so for instance, in Florida, we know hurricanes are a problem and we care about hurricanes and everyone knows that's an issue. And when hurricanes come, there's, there's storm surges, there's tides, et cetera. Um, you know, out West it's wildfires, right? So, so, you know, really being able to figure out, Hey, what do you, what do you care about? Um, and then, you know, making it, making it local. So let me give you an example. If there's a farmer in Mississippi or on the Mississippi river basin, somewhere in the Midwest, um, if you go up to them and say, Hey, do you have a second to talk about the Paris agreement and why it's important? Uh, they'll probably be like, nah, not really. I don't care. If you say, Hey, your flood, your field could flood this year and um you could lose all your crops and that'd be really devastating and i want to help you they'll be like yes let's talk right so this is a this is a bill that you know puts the resilience of strategy and it's nationwide um you know senator coons and congresswoman salazar are coastal districts but this doesn't just affect coastal districts this affects inland territories that are that are um subject to flooding um or winter storms or wildfires so depending on especially in the house you're talking to republicans from different parts of the country you know target your message to what their issues are um every district is prone to a natural disaster but they're not all the same um so i don't talk about hurricanes if i'm you know talking you know about other parts of the country um so i just want to leave it there and just kind of recap you know like make it local and you know talk about the the things that this bill does and and, and how it, how it uses resources wisely which is um, investing in the future, laying out a clear plan, and streamlining government. And I'm also happy to stick around for questions. That's great. Um, thank you. Thank you both. I mean, I think it gives you the sort of the inside story uh, as well as the way that we have to approach this. Um, and really thankful for both of you for setting it out this way because, in fact, as uh, many of the folks on this uh, on this call were part of the original R21 kind of recommendations founding, there are all kinds of angles. We've got frontline communities, we've got very urban locations, we've got rural, we've got farming, and we've got everything in between. So, um, you know, John Mark, what you're saying resonates big time because we couldn't just talk about uh, straight up urban resilience. We had to talk about a very holistic version of it. Um, so really glad you're both here. Uh, we've got some questions coming in. Um, and I think the, um, the best way to do this right now, and we'll start to pull the ones out of the, out of the chat, but if somebody wants to raise their hand, I will then uh, call on you um, and we'll, we'll go in that pattern. Okay, Alexander, why don't you un unmute yourself? Yes, good afternoon, noon, everyone. My name is Alexander Morescu. Um, pleasure to be here and uh, to see this uh, great initiative that's happening. Um, I think the one thing, I uh, just put it in the chat, but I think it's important to stress um, that what brings both parties together uh, and independence uh, is this is a business argument. Um, lofty ideas about sustainability are great. Um, they probably fall on, on most of our ears in a very positive way. Uh, but when we're talking about risk reduction and resilience, I think it is probably tolerated or even receptive, most receptive, when it is couched in cost savings, when it is looked at um, as a um, essentially as a way of reducing um, costs, uh, especially when we look at it in large infrastructure. Uh, that uh, these things affect life cycles of uh, you know billion dollar infrastructure, and there's not a state in this in this country where infrastructure is not extremely expensive. Uh, and I think we should also look at it in terms of how it saves money um, as a part of urbanization, um, with the U.S. and virtually most of the rest of the world experiencing some of the most rapid rates of uh, urbanization in human history. So I think what, uh, if we're speaking in terms of how do we engage for those who might um, not naturally in a political sense be receptive to ideas about uh, resilience as, as a sustainability argument, um, the, the, the strongest argument is to say storms are becoming more intense, uh, they are becoming more damaging and they're becoming more expensive and we have a, a playbook here to make these things cheaper. Uh, and to engage in risk transfer and engage in risk reduction. 
Um, so I will pass uh, the mic back to the floor, but uh, thanks, Stuart, for uh, letting me speak. That Alexander. Um, Emily, do you want to bring your question out? I see it in the chat, but you can unmute and say it. Sure, happy to. Emily um, from WSP and ASAP. Sorry, I'm taking you guys on a walk with me. Um, wanted to see how equity was centralized in cars and how we can kind of make sure that the folks that we're speaking with understand that connection between climate change and equity. Emily, Emily, that's a great question. Um, I, I did some environmental justice policy for, for the Biden campaign, so this is something that is, that is front of mind for me. Um, and, and, and John, Mark, I'd be curious to hear uh, your thoughts on this as well. When, when talking about whether it's environmental justice, social equity, uh, just transition, you know, like there are many words and phrases for the same idea here. Um, and I think echoing some of John Mark's points earlier, although I definitely don't want to put words in his mouth and, and I'm curious what, what he thinks, like we, have to, we have to tailor that language to who we're talking to. Um, because the bill, the bill does that. The, one of the central ideas uh, when, when this bill was written is making sure that federal dollars, there are a lot of them out there in IIJA and in other programs, that they are getting to small communities um, that do not have grant writers on staff and making sure that they have the, uh, the funds at their fingertips to do the resilience upgrades uh, that are needed for um, a just adaptation to, to climate change. And figuring out the right way to talk about those issues and, and, and the way that that is baked into this bill, um, I think is, 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 where, is where the money is. And, and, and John Mark, I'm curious to, to hear how you think about this because this is, this is very, very similar to when, when I hear you talk about this bill, some of the way that you think about it. So, so how, would, how would you approach that sort of conversation when talking to Republican members? Absolutely. Um, and I'm just going to be very blunt. Um, you know, a lot of this is messaging and framing, as I said, um, and equity is, is a word that Republicans don't use a lot or when, when it's used at them, um, they, you know, f figure out there's some other premise there. So it's just kind of one of those words that um, I don't think our side uses much. And so I would avoid that word with Republicans, but this bill does promote equity. And the way I would phrase that is saying, hey, you know, when disasters strike, uh, you know, the most vulnerable communities, the poorest, the, um, the ones with the least resources um, are hurt the most. And how do we help the people that are hurt the most? Um, you've got to target that resiliency to those places. And as Chris mentioned, this bill not only does geographic diversity um, within the distribution of, of, of funds to promote resilience, uh, but looks at, at smaller um, communities that, that are the most in need. Um, so I would, you know, just simply say, hey, look, if you're trying to help the most in need, um, the policy is built in. Um, and that's why I think this bill is, is, was fantastically drafted um, and actually is something that, that should be able to pass Congress. Great. Um, I don't see any other hands. We have some other chat questions, um, but please do raise your hand and, and feel free to, to, to speak up. Um, I know we have a number of chief resilience officers from a variety of, of ge geographic. Oh, sorry, the calls. You keep an ear out for um, both. Uh, so um, we do have some other questions um, that had came in previously. Um, one of the questions was: as we get to uh, the respondents and as we get to the to the um, the, the co conveners and their calls to action. From the, from the two of you, how do we keep the bipartisan nature of the bill going? Because I think that's the thing that it struck me. You're right, like you read the definitions all the way through it at the very beginning. It really feels like something that has um, lots of different input in it. So um, I think one of the questions that came um, prior to the session was how do we keep and improve the bipartisan nature of it? And those that you've just raised your hands, I'll get to you. Uh, we'll go with you, Beth, and then Richard, and then Michael. John, Mark, you want to take a first stab at this one? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to put equal energy in, in you know, talking to both parties. Um, and, you know, 
Chris and I have seen interest on both sides right now. And if we hit a point where there's a lot more interest on one side, then we can shift resources over. Um, but right now, I think we're just trying to build um, co-sponsors one and one, you know, as, as much as we can just to keep it bipartisan and to show that. Um, and as we continue these conversations, we can readjust if, if you know, there's a preponderance on, on either side. Yeah, no, I think I think that's I think that's totally right. Um, I think another just thought that I'll add briefly is is this is not a this is not hopefully a years long legislative project. We've got in the next few months an opportunity to get this done, and and it is bipartisan right now. So let's ride that momentum that we have and get it done this Congress. Um, and just sort of re-upping the asks that I made earlier about talking to your members and their staff. Please, please, please reach out to to Mahir to Stewart. And, and you can get my email address from them and, and, and we can chat we can chat offline. I'd be really happy to do that. That's great. Um, Beth, let's go to you. So one of the strategies that strikes me about this is that we're trying to get it passed through using the National Defense Act. And I wonder if either of you could speak to strategies to ensure that DOD and the military is really strongly supporting this. I think that there's a lot of efficiency arguments to be made. I mean, the quadrennial report comes out every year and identifies climate risk as a top concern. This report would seemingly do that for the civilian side for the country as well. And just wonder, like, what tips could you give us to ensure that this, that we're making the case to those who might have influence in having this be included in the NDA, in the National Defense Act? That, that is a fantastic question. Um, and I think a fact, that, a fact that I like to point to is that resilience and understanding climate change as a national security threat, that was something that first came out of the defense community. We look back five or seven years ago, uh, mainstreaming, and, and before that, decades ago. Um, so so this, is, this is not a new thing in those circles. Uh, and when I talk to people in those circles, they understand this. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not a tough sell. Um, and that's something... That's, that's something that I haven't said on this call yet. Um, this, this bill should not be a tough sell. It should not be a tough sell. The, the people who we need to convince understand that this is important. It's just an attention game and, and necessary to make sure that the members have had the, right, uh, the correct number of touches and, and in the right way from their constituents. Besides that, this, you know, we have a lane and we can get this done. Um, it's not going to be, you know, skillful, very crafted argumentation. It's going to be just grassroots constituents getting in touch with their members um, and, and, and those members knowing how to vote in the committee. Um, but the facts, the facts are on our side here. And, and with, with the right communication done skillfully in the next few months, um, we're, we're, we're able to do this. Yeah, and I would just add that this is a national security issue. Uh, you know, uh, when, you know, when the floor, when when something happens in Florida, as a hurricane, for instance, you activate the entire Southeast National Guard. All the states come in, and and, and we send guard to other states when you know Louisiana or something has issues. Um, and that's time that they aren't spent um, doing other projects or even working with you know foreign militaries to train people. You know, so um, and doing partnerships. But on top of that, you know, you don't want to worry about the the vulnerabilities of your of your homeland during wartime and so i would just strictly say this is a national defense issue i think the military knows that and understands it and congress has been good at getting some um language in in former national defense authorization acts um and just making the point that hey this is a cost saver in the long run you know it's as someone, someone said earlier this is a business decision um you know this investing now saves money and saves more resources to focus on um, you know, what a lot of Republicans think the military should be doing, which is, you know, preparing for, you know, a, a war and not worrying about, you know, storms at home. Michael, let's go to you. Michael Wall. Hey, I'm the executive director at Green Spaces in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, and certainly running a sustainability nonprofit in the third district of Tennessee. Uh, we have a lot of experience uh, sort of talking across uh, political lines. Uh, and I would, would echo a lot of what John said in terms of avoiding, avoiding third rail terms and uh, you know, really talking from, from a place of shared values um, when, when we talk about these issues. But certainly 
whenever we've worked with both House and Senate staff on these issues, there was a lot of support for them. And so I literally just before this got off the call with Marsha Blackburn staff. And so I'm happy to um, reach out to them about this. But one of the questions that I had is about the relationship, if any, between this and the Civilian Climate Corps, which is also one of the sort of top bipartisan uh, components of uh, the the sort of climate agenda. Is, is there any sort of relationship there or are these totally separate? Well, I'd be happy to talk uh, talk on that first considering that Senator Coons uh, has, has the leading bill in the Senate on the Civilian Climate Corps. Um, in a dream world where we get all of our legislative priorities done, these are both law next year and they work together with synchronicity and it's all great. Uh, that <laughs> is, is, is not how it works. Um, I really hope that gets done this Congress. Frankly, NCARS has a much better chance of getting past this Congress. Um, so, so, so we're focused on getting this done. If we can get the Civilian Climate Court done as well, there are so many ways where, where, where these two uh, bills become law would, would work together so wonderfully. Um, but in terms of the actual legislative text moving through the process steps in Congress, they are not actually tied together. Um, one, one last question before we move to our, our respondents. Um, as I'm trying to keep this on time, but it's a really good question. Um, Liz Corrigan asked um, about the coordination at the federal level from sort of the federal uh, chief resilience officer on down into the agencies. And her question is, how do you ensure that the strategies to do that don't create more bureaucracy? I'm, I'm shortening it um, so we get the question out. But like, in other words, it sounds really good. We have it in our recommendations for Resilience 21. A bunch of people in here helped write those. Uh, and now it feels like, be careful what you wish for maybe, right? So um, how do we keep the efficiency moving and not create more bureaucracy while we get people to work together better? Because that does need to happen. So, so de uh, definitely curious what the Republican bureaucracy busting um, idea is on this, but <laughs> but from the Democratic side, what I would uh, what I would add is we're, that, we're a federal uh, agency. <laughs> yeah, thank thanks for the clarification. Um, what I would add from 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 our side is um, the the last part of the bill that we're we're actually still working on on figuring out the legislative text details is working with a few key experts to make sure that we understand how this would be implemented within the staffing structure of the White House. Like we are getting that granular of making sure that these dollars are spent best to set up this staffing structure so that it can do the most, right? This is not just a good idea that we're trying to get past for political points. We are working with people who have decades of experience working in the White House complex, understanding uh, the strengths and weaknesses of that place to make sure that this office is maximally set up for success. Um, so, so just at a ledge text perspective, legislative text perspective, that's what I would add. Um, John Mark, definitely curious if you have any other thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, I'll just say some quick. Um, I formerly worked for the executive branch. Um, I've worked at agencies and, you know, I think there's a lot of improvements that can be made. Um, and I will say that also a lot of times agencies don't talk to each other just because they're so worried about what they're doing, um, unless there's a proactive effort or, or, you know, directive to do it. It just happens at the back end when everything meets the White House versus, you know, on the front end where, you know, agencies should be talking together on square one. So I think that, that this streamline resources without having to increase staff time or work and actually, you know, makes sense and makes it more productive without having to do that. Um, so I think having a clear directive and consolidating that on the front end is going to be good. Um, and of course, there's always room to improve. And, and the, you know, I think Congress's oversight role, too, uh, is, is always good in, in watching what's happening and seeing where there can be improvements. Great. So um, lots of questions still coming up in the chat and we're recording this. So we'll, we'll have them and we can we can bring them back to you as we as we think about this. So to enliven this conversation a little bit, we've asked three respondents to um, uh, say a few things from their angle. Um, I'm super happy, as I said at the top of the, uh, the top of the session, that we have uh, Kyle as a CRO. We have Jade 
who works for Indian Collective and has been on the R21 Leadership Circle and, and also on the White House um, EJ Council. Um, and then Tom Santos from Zurich um, on the corporate and insurance side. So um, we're gonna have each of them um, put in a little bit of uh, additional flavor to the conversation um, over the next uh, 25 minutes or so. And then we'll go to our, um, our, our co-conveners and then have another uh, Q&A session. So I hope you'll all stay with us. I'm going to turn it over to Kyle Spencer, the Chief Resilience Officer for Norfolk. Thanks. Just real quick, Stuart, before, before Kyle goes, uh, in case Chris and John have to drop, just want to thank you both again for, for joining us. Really, really appreciate it and feeling, uh, feeling the Q&A and um, look forward to continuing to working with you both to get this bipartisan push and get this bill across the finish line. Absolutely. I'm going to drop off, but thanks, everyone. Uh, keep up the hard work and, you know, feel free to share my contact with anyone that wants to reach out directly. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, John. Yep, yep, got to hop off as well, but thank you all so much. And, and just echoing, please contact me through, uh, through me here in the co-conveners. All right, have a good evening. Thanks, Chris. Whiskey, what is going on? Uh, got some feedback there. I'm not sure what that was. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak uh, about this. Um, you know, I'm... I'm in the last few days, spent some time to try to get smart on it and learn, learn, learn more about it. And I really think this is a crucial role for, for the nation to get behind. Um, you know, Norfolk is, is really a, almost a, a great proxy of the, of the entire nation. We have the largest naval base in the world. We have the third largest port facility on the East Coast. We're, we're the second um, fastest rate of sea level rise in, on the East Coast, uh, second to uh, New Orleans. And so all of these things that have been brought up are, you know, just at the top of mind for us, and we're we're dealing with them every day. And you know, we we've been um, you know lucky enough to to be a recipient of funds from the IIJA to support our Army Corps of Engineers work, but we also work closely with HUD and DOT and the and Department of Defense, and and this idea of whole of government and, and sort of streamlining these different disciplines and getting them to talk together is something that we would um, really appreciate having because we struggle a lot of times with um, sort of, uh, you know, it's sort of a shell game. You're, you're, you're talking to one group, you're talking to another, you're sort of um, talking about things in a way uh, that you think will, um, uh, that they'll understand in their world, but they're really, um, they really should be all collectively brought together. And this is something in our, in our city the resilience office sits at the executive branch, and I think that's the right place for it to be. We're, I'm not tied to a specific department or, or a mission, so to speak. We are um, we're we're actually sort of the group that brings all these different departments together around these super hard problems that uh, historically we don't typically go after or try to solve because we couldn't figure out whose wheelhouse it went in. And so the resilience office really brings everyone around to to tackle these problems to the ground. And, um, and I think that's a great model that the, that, uh, that could be followed. And I, and I would say um, our, our, legis our legislative um, uh, group will definitely be in support of this. I will see them tomorrow, both Senator Warner and Kane staff, uh, and actually I think the senators as well will be in town. So, um, and, and as well on the House side. So I will make a point to, to just sort of bring this up at, at least in a, in, a, in a sidebar conversation else. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things like I was saying about the city of Norfolk by not being tied to the department is, is we look for those co-benefits, right? So there's so much that that can be done with, say, a flood, flood control project that, um, you know, that is more than just stopping water. We, we look for these projects to do, to do more, to, to provide um, environmental benefits, uh, social cohesion benefits, connect people to each other, to the city. Um, and help move around in ways that they haven't been able to do it before. And so when we approach these, these types of uh, uh, big projects in our city, that, that's how, that's how we're, we're coming into it, is with this resilience lens on everything. And, and how do we strengthen uh, the muscles of the residents and their resilience as well as part of the process? And I think if we did this at the national level um, and, and we had that coordination uh, across those departments, we would... Um, we would find efficiencies and find ways of doing things 
that that uh, maybe weren't wouldn't, wouldn't be realized otherwise. So, um, and 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 I think that that's the opportunity uh, for the CRO would would to be you know taking that strategy or that plan and and directing those investments that provide those co benefit outcomes um, and using um, and, and using that that um, uh, that role to um, to kind of kind of uh, force these these folks to get on the same page. Um, you know, we see it a lot, especially between like FEMA and the Army Corps is a good example with the way they model flooding, flood insurance rate maps. Insurance uh, is a flood insurance is a big deal in Norfolk for us as well because we're um, we're so low lying. We we have um, the the highest number of severe repetitive loss repetitive loss properties in the state of Virginia, and so so being um, you know, present in the National Flood Insurance Program and, and working with our residents uh, to lower their insurance rates is something we're hit up, um, uh, you know, um, hit by this, the, by our residents on to do more. And I think if we had that that same level of coordination at the national level, we could be doing things um, better uh, across the board um, as far as, as far as that goes. Uh, we are a CRS community, um, and that does provide some benefits, but um, but I think there's there's much more that could be done. Um, so I, I, again, I just thank you all for the opportunity to, to speak on in support of this. And again, I will circle up with our our um, our delegation in, in Virginia as early as tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon um, to uh, get behind this and support it. And um, and just please let me know um, if there's anything else I can do to to help from from our side down here in Norfolk. Um, but I'll hand it back to you, Stuart, for the next one. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Uh, that's really great. Um, it does represent why that CRO office is so important um, and the role um, of the of the Chief Resilience Officer. Um, we're going to turn now to um, Jade Begay from Indian Collective. Um, look at this from the angle of frontline communities, um, especially in her case and the work that she's doing in Indigenous communities across the country. So, Jade, over to you. Stuart. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to drop a link to NDN Collective's website so you all can uh, learn more about our work. Um, I'm the Climate Justice Campaign Director there um, and happy to be here. So um, as we know, tribes and Indigenous frontline communities are experiencing climate impacts right now. Um, you know, from the relocation of uh, the village of Newtok in Alaska due to permafrost loss to tribes in Louisiana experiencing sea level rise and the loss of their homelands. Um, and, and right in my ancestral homelands in New Mexico, we're, I hope, all aware of the um, historic wildfires um, currently raging there, um, which, which has now become the largest wildfire in New Mexican history. Um, and, and this crisis alone is creating immense challenges that our state will be dealing with for years and years to come, um, including uh, insurance issues that Kyle was just speaking to. Um, you know, just wanting to highlight that um, not all rural communities or indigenous communities approach um, insur home insurance the same way as, you know, a family living in, in the suburbs. Um, so there are big differences there and big inequities and gaps that, you know, we, we do need to be considering when we're talking about resilience and access to resources. So in addition to that, um, there are parts of in the country um, that are already experiencing or have already experienced flood and extreme weather, and it's not even the half year mark. So this is why we need legislation like this to create systems of protection and resilience for the changes that we're experiencing right now and, and will continue to see as time goes on actually more frequently um, because of, of the rate of which the climate is changing. Um, so more, more specifically, just talking about what does, what, what uh, resilience does look like or an important piece of resilience, uh, what that looks like for Indian country. And I, I wanna focus on um, resilience is incredibly important when it comes to infrastructure in tribal communities and indigenous communities. Um, we know that when infrastructure is threatened, both by, uh, is threatened both 
uh, physical and economic security come under duress as the systems that provide essentials like food, clean water, electricity, healthcare, uh, the list goes on, are, are placed in jeopardy, right? Um, so uh, yeah, just really wanting to uh, highlight that piece. Um, and, and regarding engagement, I thought this was an interesting um, uh, conversation dialogue that came up earlier. Um, I wanted to highlight the um, uh, 2022 um, report released by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's the it's called the Unmet Infrastructure Needs of Tribal Communities and Alaska Native Villages um, in Process of Relocating to Higher Ground as a result of climate change. Um, and in this report, they found four main issues when it comes to meeting infrastructure needs, specifically um, in, in tribal communities and building resilience. Um, and those four, main, uh, four issues, issue areas are um, that there is a significant unmet need for financial resources. Um, there is a need for technical support to navigate the scope of required financial and technical resources and institutional barriers to accessing resources. So that very much applies to, you know, what this uh, piece of legislation can mean for tribes. Um, there's also a unmet need to address the lack of information and data. And then there's a need around acknowledging and working to understand relocation complexities, especially on the cultural side for indigenous and tribal, um, indigenous communities and tribal nations. Um, so I just wanted to mention that resource um, and also acknowledge the engagement with, um, yeah, encourage the uh, engagement with tribal um, climate, the tribal climate resilience branch within the BO, uh, BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, let's see. So, so also tonight there was a mention about creating less bureaucracy and ensuring that there is a streamlined process here. And to that, I wanted to mention that due to colonization, tribes have had decisions about their futures imposed on them from the out, from outside entities. This happens all the time still. Um, a key element of tribal sovereignty involves tribes identifying their own needs and priorities and leading their own responses and actions, especially when it comes to resilience and adaptation. Um, so I just see a, a real need here to popularize this type of legislation and begin outreach early on with tribes and indigenous communities. So we are aware of the programs and the initiatives within it. Um, we know that these types of strategies and initiatives are multifaceted. Um, you know, we can, we can just take a look at Justice 40, um, that initiative. And even now, um, and I know well, um, being a member of WeJack, um, that a year later, a year and change later, we're still working on, um, we're still working to make all of that information and, and updates with uh, regarding certain programs and tools accessible to people who, who need them most, right? Those disadvantaged communities. So I think this is a, um, an issue of strong engagement, but also equity and accessibility. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention um, in relation to WeJack, um, I really wanna encourage folks on this call to participate in the WeJack public comment, uh, sorry, the WeJack public, com uh, public meetings. Um, and for those of, uh, I think we still might have a few folks from the Hill here, but to um, encourage those folks also to meet with us um, regarding the implementation um, of this legislation as WeJack has developed a climate resilience working group um, and, and, we, uh, and, and we, that body, we could be a huge resource in the build out of this legislation. Thanks. And thanks so much. Quick shout out um, because Jay mentioned sort of the unique nature here and the empowerment that needs to happen. Um, Indian Collective has also spun off uh, the Indian Fund, um, and the Indian Fund has been working on, with Lori and a number of other people, on a whole resilience and regeneration assessment that goes into all the, the loans that they're doing, and it's a super unique, I mean, really almost a point one of a kind model um, that's connected to larger uh, uh, national projects that, that, are, that are happening along those lines, um, and again, that's kind of assessment and funding, and that's one of those things that if it's done in the traditional indigenous way uh, comes from there. It's not 
comes from out where, out from somewhere else. So um, if you have a chance to look at their site and look at, at the Indian Fund piece, that's also really interesting. Um, now we're going to shift gears, and it's in the deeper into the finance space uh, in particular. And um, welcome Tom Santos from Zurich, North America, um, and uh, hear a bit from him. And um, again, thanks to, to Jade and Kyle. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or most good evening, I guess. Um, Stuart, thanks for, for having me this afternoon. Uh, for, for those who don't know, uh, Zurich is a large uh, international uh, property and casualty company in the United States. We're mostly on, on the commercial side, but we do have some um, homeowners business. Uh, look, I, I'm going to be, I think I'll be super brief. I, I think I'd rather get to the question and answers. Um, but um, you know, I think Stuart mentioned at the outset we're partnering with with the Resilient Cities Network on some on a resiliency project. And look, at a very high level, um, our, our company sees climate risk um, as a sort of as a, as the most significant long term risk facing um, societies across the globe, not just here, but here in the United States. Um, it's interdependent. It's inter it's intergenerational. It's international. So, uh, addressing climate risk and resiliency is, is a key component. Uh, of Zurich's mission. And look, we have, uh, as Stuart mentioned, we have unique insight into this risk. Uh, we uh, pay claims. We see how uh, hazards, whether they be weather hazards or, or other natural hazards, um, affect people, affect communities uh, across the country and the globe, and, and the hardship that that creates uh, when they're trying to respond. Um, it's been clear to us um, both in our own data, uh, and someone mentioned the, the NIB study and FEMA data, our own data uh, confirms that if you invest on the front end or if you uh, take pre-disaster mitigation and, and, and help prevent those losses before they happen, um, communities, businesses, individuals recover far more quickly uh, than just relying on uh, post-disaster, either insurance claim or uh, some disaster money. So we do, uh, from the insurance side, um, this is a critical component for us. Um, we've been at this uh, both as a company uh, for a number of years. Uh, we've been uh, more active recently in terms of our advocacy. We've, we've had the opportunity to testify twice this year uh, in Congress, once before TNI, uh, once before the House Climate Committee. Um, and I think our message there is, look, the response to this crisis cannot be overdone, right? Um, I want to quote one of our witnesses, um, and it cannot be overdone and require the combined efforts of all citizens, communities, corporations, small business, and all levels of government um, and require unprecedented cooperation. So I think the NCARS bill is a terrific start uh, to, to, to engage in that cooperation. And I was just looking through uh, real quick and as I was even just a few minutes ago trying to prepare um, the industry, the insurance industry, and we're members of, of the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, who is also supportive uh, of NCAR. So um, the property and casualty sector is, is, is behind this um, bill. But I was, I was looking at some of the other efforts we as an industry are engaged in on the appropriation side, on resiliency and other things. Um, and I, I, just off the top of my head, there's one, two, three, four, five, seven separate agencies through appropriations monies that are funding projects, whether it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Forestry Service, whether it's NOAA and, and Weather Prediction. Um, we've talked about DHS and HUD and FEMA. So, so having, having an entity that can help coordinate all of these efforts, um, I think would go a long way um, to helping do that. And if, if all you get is coordination, that would be, I think, progress, right? Um, I don't think anybody, I don't think the bill is, is sort of saying that the Department of Agriculture or the Forestry Service or FEMA role has changed. It's just someone sitting at the top kind of looking around, seeing that everything is, um, is, is being done efficiently. Grant money is going to where it needs to be. It's going to the right places. It's getting to the communities um, that need it most. So I think um, this bill is, is certainly a good step in the right direction. And as I said, we, from, from Zerk's point of view, uh, we kind of need this is all hands on deck um, to try to address this. Thanks so much, Tom, and um, encouraging to have you um, talking about the associations um, at the insurance and reinsurance level and the work you're already doing to bring other insurance um, companies along. Um, I can I can vouch personally that that's happening in the work that we're doing to build up the RCI fund, um, and that's amazing to see um, within the sector to kind of bring this along. Um, it also gets a little bit to some of the uh, points that I think 
we're going to want to hear in terms of how we get out there to be sure that everyone understands this what this bill is. Um, and that leads me to switch us over to our co-conveners um, and have them say a few words, and then we'll get back to Q&A. Um, again, huge thanks uh, to um, Union of Concerned Scientists and ASAP and um, Future Charitable Trusts. Um, with uh, the co-convening, but also with the work that they're doing on the ground and haven't already for, for, for NCAR. So um, let me turn first to Beth Gibbons, who's the Executive Director at ASAP. Where are you on my screen there, I see I'm right here. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, everybody, for being in this call this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about a few different resources, so I've dropped them into the chat for you. Uh, first off, for those who may not be familiar with ASAP, we're the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. We're a network that supports and connects climate adaptation and resilience professionals to accelerate innovation and excellence in the field of climate adaptation. This is the first time that ASAP has ever supported a piece of legislation, and it's because it's the first time that we've really seen a piece of federal congressional legislation that's actually addressed adaptation and resilience holistically. So I know, as you all feel, there are a lot of ways you could be spending your time calling your senators, calling your representatives. So I'm going to give you a pitch for why you should be calling them about this. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the ways that ASAP's going to support you to get that work done as easily as possible. So first, if Congress en enacts this legislation, we're going to move from relying on a series of individual agency activities authorized through executive actions, kind of one at a time, to a long-term coherent national strategy to ensure climate change preparedness. NCARS recognizes that adaptation practitioners and frontline communities have been at this work for a long time, and it creates a clear pathway to bring that wisdom into the national adaptation strategy through really well-structured, well-designed working groups and councils. The NCARS bill would end the ad hoc nature of climate adaptation planning at the national level and form a dependable and a consistent basis for us to build a more resilient country. And if we can do that, then passing this legislation is going to support the creation of thousands of jobs because it's going to be signaling that there's predictable federal support for climate change adaptation work, which is going to encourage employers from across all sectors and industries to implement adaptation and resilience infrastructure, social services, and other programs that we all know that we need. And finally, by mandating reports on a quadrennial basis, this is going to promote consistency of reporting, and it's going to tag us up with other regular reporting, which is happening in the climate space and across other departments. However, it is going to take time to stand up this kind of ongoing quadrennial process, which is why we need to get this passed and we need to pass it as soon as possible. And I'm encouraging you to put it on your priority list for your phone calls. So right now, ASAP is working in three areas. We're trying to make sure that our members know about the legislation and share it in your networks. We're encouraging key Republican members of Congress to co-sponsor the legislation, but we'll take the Dems too, for sure. And three, we're encouraging chairs and the ranking members of committees responsible for reviewing the legislation to take it up. So for one, we've released a blog. I've put it in the post and I've also dropped some of the talking points out loud here about why we support it. For action areas two and three, we are supporting member meetings with their, rep with their representatives in Florida, Ohio, Michigan, and Utah. So if you're somebody who lives in one of those areas, reach out to me directly or join ASAP and reach out to us through our policy practice group to get in on those conversations. We're also creating guidance to publish op-eds to push for the support of this. So again, if you're not part of ASAP yet, I recommend that you join. If you don't want to join, but you just want to support this, reach out to me or reach out to people in the policy practice group of ASAP, and we can help you to make sure we push this forward. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, everyone, for everything that you do all the time, everywhere. Thanks. Uh, that was amazing. Um, and you know, um, I'm not paid to say become a member. Um, I became one and was very happy with it because the interactions with the, the large membership they have, um, very holistic, uh, amazing group of people, uh, amazing leadership. So a um, little bit of a, a, a shift. i um, going to go to uh, to Shanna from um, Union Concerned Scientists. And um, uh, where'd you go? Oh, there you are. Hi, Shanna. Okay. Hi. Um, let's go to you. And, um, and then we will um, go to uh, Forbes with our next group. Wonderful, thank you, Stuart. And thanks to everybody for being on the call and to Jade for 
um, that great introduction to all the work you're doing um, with tribal communities. Um, just as a way of background, the Union of Concerned Scientists is a nonprofit national organization working for over 50 years on conducting independent science. And our uh, climate impacts team has been working on uh, doing our own science on climate impacts, particularly in the last five years on sea level rise and extreme heat. Okay, and I just, uh, I just so wanted to ask, uh, someone's got to mute their phone. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I just wanted to mention a few of the striking findings um, that um, we, we found in the um, last few reports. And so with no action to reduce emissions by mid-century, we found for our sea level rise analysis that more than 300 coastal homes will be in a lower 48 states will uh, be impacted by chronic inundation from high tides. These homes are valued at uh, the 2018 market value at um, almost $118 billion. And our extreme heat analysis found that the average number of days per year with a heat index of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit will more than double in the US contiguous uh, states and the number of days um, above 105 degrees Fahrenheit uh, will quadruple by mid-century. So these are really striking impacts and it's going to um, really implement, um, impact every um, community as you can imagine. So if you scroll up into the chat, you'll see that I um, added a few links to our underwater report and to the killer heat report that um, provide you a unique uh, congressional district fact sheet that you can use when you're talking to um, your members of Congress. And I think this will be really helpful. Um, if you need any help on uh, getting those fact sheets, just uh, please reach out to me. Um, so I just wanted to mention that we're really, um, really happy to be supporting this bill. All of our science shows that we really need the help, uh, the communities really need help, um, especially frontline communities and communities that are historically disadvantaged. And so we think this bill will really help to um, provide uh, that strategy to help communities and help federal agencies uh, be, be more coordinated. So we're working with Resilience 21 and all of the organizations on this, on this call to help educate supporters um, our, sorry, our members and supporters. And we're doing that by sending an alert, an action alert, asking them to call on their um, senators to co-sponsor the bill. And we'll be working on reaching out with other, with offices um, through uh, coordinating with Resilience 21. So I'll turn it back over to you, Stuart. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks for all those efforts you're doing in, in, in putting together the, the kinds of documents. Um, we hear that a lot from chief resilience officers and others like, do you have something that summarizes? Uh, and I was on a call yesterday because there's three or four other things happening along with NCARS. Um, and so we all need these sort of cliff notes for each of these things. So we know to know what to do and, and how to engage people. Um, so uh, last but not least, I'm gonna turn it to uh, Forbes, Tom Forbes Tompkins from uh, the Pew Charitable Trust um, and uh, give us um, what they've been doing on the bill and uh, as we look forward on the, the, the call to action. Great, thanks Stuart. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to join you today on behalf of the Pew Charitable Trust and our flood prepare community program that I lead the uh, federal policy portfolio for. Really honored to co-convene uh, on such an important discussion about this pressing issue of, you know, increasingly frequent and costly disasters that are impacting the lives of Americans across the country daily, um, but also this key component of the solution in the form of the bipartisan NCARS bill that would really make strides toward enhancing the coordination, efficiency, and effectiveness of federal resilience efforts and resources through this whole of government approach that others have already talked about today. Um, for a quick 101 about Pew, we're a nonpartisan 501c3 that really aims to use data-driven approaches to tackle significant domestic and international challenges. It's been 50 or so programs working on issues ranging from pensions to penguins uh, and many issues in between, such as flooding. Our Flood Prepared Communities program, the core really of our work is, is to develop and pursue federal and state policies that can benefit the American taxpayer communities and the environment with respect to the impacts of flood related disasters. Um, and just a couple quick ways that we do that. Uh, we use kind of a layered approach 
uh, at the federal level, trying to modernize national flood insurance program, enhance investment in disaster mitigation, and improve the resilience of infrastructure. Uh, and then on the state side, we're working on a combination of policies and involved legislation, executive actions, comprehensive planning, uh, and research that kind of cut across multiple sectors and discipline, which really syncs well, I think, with the NCARS bill. Um, related to the bill, you know, Chris, John, Mark, others have already done a terrific job summarizing the key points of the bill uh, and why it's so critical. So I'll just quickly note a few opportunities for folks here to help build a groundswell of support for the bill uh, in ways that can move the needle within the halls of Congress. Um, so what I think is so impressive about tonight's town hall is actually the potential to really leverage the collective power of all your voices. So 100%, everyone should engage individually as a constituent and through your networks with your members of Congress. So they know this bill should be a priority and the bill is something they should co-sponsor and pass into law. To complement and help amplify your support individually, Pew actually recently launched a local and state stakeholder support letter, uh, which in a matter of just a few weeks has collected signatures from more than 125 uh, chief resilience officers, local and state elected officials, small business owners, chambers of commerce, insurance companies, economic development councils, housing coalitions, and, and other influential uh, people and groups. And I just wanted to note those just in case you might fit within that scope or even uh, additional representatives or constituencies uh, that we might want to add. Uh, and along those lines, uh, as a number the number of these signees grows, so will the letter's usefulness with members of Congress demonstrating that broad and extensive support across the country um, and helping mitigate the risk of this bill potentially being politicized by some, but instead being embraced as a practical and cr critically needed solution to address comprehensive resilience before disaster strike. So as far as the call to action uh, for Pew, I believe Stuart hopefully is gonna be able to share the local support letter as part of his follow-up uh, with everyone here tonight, along with uh, our contact information here at Pew. And we would love to engage further with any and all local and state leaders or, or groups interested in joining that letter. Um, and for you know the national level of efforts that we're doing, uh, we will have a national support letter for national organizations um, that's being finalized now, should be ready in, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and that's something we'd be happy to follow up with um, as well, and similar to what Shauna and, and Beth and others are leading, you know, we're, we're hitting the halls of Congress ourselves with GR fact sheet summaries, um, and also, you know, love to bring people in to DC as well. So we're not operating in the vacuum within a beltway, but speaking to the needs on the ground uh, across the country. So uh, thanks for the time. And with that, Stuart, I'll throw it back to you. That's right, Forbes. Thanks very much. Um, definitely, we will uh, be happy to send that out and to the the uh, growing um, email list, as well as uh, make sure that we're pinging people on the LinkedIn group. Um, shame on me. I'm usually really good at at promoting our 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 21 LinkedIn group and and making sure that everyone uh, gets involved with that. Um, but if you aren't familiar with that, just just ping me um, because you have my email. Um, and we can get you on there. And definitely we and others, and I think a lot on the group here from a national support letter standpoint, would like to be able to do that too for us. So we can distribute and sign on because um, we already have said um, that we want to do that. Um, so now um, we have, uh, which has never happened in the R21 history, we're ahead of schedule. Um, I don't even know what to do with myself. Um, because usually we are scraping out Q&A at the back end of the, of the session. So um, now we have time for people to raise their hands um, and add in comments um, and um, ask questions, because I do think we were starting to hit kind of a, um, a momentum there in some of the questions and the back and forth and discussion. Um, fortunately, we lost our, our, our congressional um, folks, but um, amongst all of us, um, I still think there's uh, quite a bit of conversation to have. So let's let's use this time because it's a it's a rare occasion when when <laughs> we're out of schedule and we're all together at the same time, at least on Zoom. Well, uh, Tom Santos here again. Like I, I, Forbes reminded me of this as we're thinking about the messaging on this, um, and folks are are targeting towards uh, a particular audience. Um, it may resonate more with with some conservatives, but and I probably should have mentioned this. Look, in, in, in certain communities. I've heard a few folks mention 
uh, Florida, Norfolk, and others where, where the, the risks of flood are extraordinarily high. Um, at some point, without a good resiliency plan in place, insurance in those communities is going to become either completely unaffordable or, in worst case scenario, unavailable. Right? So that will have a real fundamental economic impact on those communities if, if people and businesses cannot afford insurance. And, and we're not talking just about NFIP coverage, right? The cost will rise exponentially for those places and um, it, it will affect real estate markets. It will affect small businesses reopening. It will affect uh, sort of down the line. So uh, as we think about messaging and you're thinking about sort of what the sort of downstream kind of economic impact is, that's I think something that we have found when we talk to um, Republicans at least in some of this stuff, that the cost of insurance um, for, for businesses is real. Um, the cost of insurance for underserved communities is also for real. And if you can't, if you can't um, make those communities more resilient, um, they, they simply can't afford insurance policies, right? We see this in NFIP. We see this in the fights over rates on NFIP and the like. So um, cost of insurance is, is, a, is, in some audiences, a pretty compelling message as well. Yeah, that's great, Tom. And and I wrote down the three things that, that John Mark said, right? Um, this is why NCARS is important. And it felt like it was, uh, I was getting my script of talking points, right, for, for both sides of the aisle. It sets a strategy, it does streamlining and efficiency, and it invests in the future. And of course, if you really believe in holistic resilience, it's all about building forward and the recovery rather than the recovery all the time. Because um, obviously we spend a lot of our time and money in the recovery space. Uh, Ginger, let's go to you. Um, so this question is for Tom. I'm curious in that regard with the insurance, um, you know, I, I'm wondering like how long is it before the agencies will just, the insurers will just say, sorry, we're not doing this anymore. Or has there been any discussion about separating the coastal pool from the rest of the country? Because, you know, like why should the rest of us pay to keep rebuilding places that should have managed retreat? Um, and of course that could be said for fire prone areas as well. Yeah, look, this gets into a whole range of issues on insurance. I'm not sure is, is the message here, right? Um, in, insurers will, will, they'll make adjustments in their exposures. They'll make adjustments in their rates as, as events happen or don't happen. Right? We're all right, we're right at the state level. So we've got significant um, regulatory barriers at, at state levels as well. Um, but nearly every state, I think, they have a residual market or they have a high risk pool for, for these perils, right? Um, if we think back a few years, I don't mean to pick on this state, but they have a high risk of hurricanes and flooding. Uh, years ago, the state of Florida was the largest insure, homeowners insurer in the state of Florida, right? So that's not a sort of, again, when you talk to, to conservatives or Republicans, that's not a free market mechanism where the, the state is the insurer for the majority of properties, right? That's changed a little bit over time. Florida's gotten a little bit better. Florida's also done a better job of building codes in a lot of other states. So there's a lot of other factors that go into covering or, or providing insurance. Um, we see this fight a little bit in, in California in some Western states where, where wildfire has been prevalent over the past couple of years and insurers are trying to really figure out uh, what their risk is, what the risk appetite is, where they can they write cover, where they can't write cover. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated question, um, but at the end of the day, if, if the risk gets too high, um, private market insurers, they make their own assessments on what risk they're willing to take and they stay or they don't. And then you're sort of dependent upon these high risk pools at the states. And, and those rates oftentimes are, are not better, right? That you're in the state pool. Um, they get politicized in a lot of different places. You think Texas, Windstorm Association, think NFIP, right? like it gets more bogged down in that. So, um, and I would add on this, insurance for, for some of the, the reputation we have, that, that risk price, what, what is charging a premium? That sends a signal to folks or it should send a signal to folks that if you are paying X for flood insurance or X for fire coverage, it should be allowed to tell you that you are in a risky area or maybe not so much. Or if you elevate and you get, you know, you're, you're mitigating against your risk or you're taking, um, you're using better building codes or fire resistant building codes and all of those things will matter. Um, and it makes insurance, a, a, a private insurance, a good option for. So that's again, that's a really complicated thing. We could talk for hours about how any particular insurer or state addresses it, but um, 
it does matter to a great deal, I think, and it should be sending signals to businesses and homeowners what the risk is. Um, you know, Tom, and and we'll get to some questions in the chat because there's some really interesting ones. And Jim pointed out the Florida um, Catastrophic Insurance Fund um, funded by the surcharges. Um, but also, you know, your first comment um, and the way that the insurance and funding and financing and having a resilient strategy, um, Kyle and Norfolk uh, can tell the story of uh, a bond rating that nearly went south until uh, the particular bond uh, uh, agency saw that there was a resilience strategy for Norfolk and they did not lower the bond rating, right? Um, there are stories like this that are project-based, you know, one house at a time, one community facility at a time, and then kind of larger. And the point more is that if we continue to kind of use those assessments and we have the right kind of funding, which kind of NGARS is saying, let's do it from the top down, um, it can start to move that and then it, it, it fluctuates and, and moves the insurance with it. I think one of the questions that I have about NCARS, um, let's see, Sam has brought up, and that is how do we talk about that community fabric, the local level, things that Jay brought up about indigenous communities, about tribal communities, whether you're, we're talking Alaska or, or New Orleans or wherever it might be. Um, now, how does what's in NCARS push far enough down and financial funding and flows from agencies along with other funding and things that all of us are trying to do um, and keep those local relationships and ties. And I think that's something that seems much more top down than bottom up, um, but I'd be interested to hear what others think about that um, and that kind of local ties and building relationships because the social fabric really makes places safer um, just to kind of like, you know, summarize that. Um, how do we do that, right? And I know some of you run programs that are around that. I know we do to some extent, but I um, want to open that one up to the floor because I think it's a it's a really great great question that no insurance in the world can solve in some ways, right? Stuart, I think uh, just to comment on, on that a little bit, the, the, the action really is at the local level. I mean, the, the cities and the localities are are equipped with the the policies and the ability to change zoning codes or change uh, or, or implement implement projects and, and things like that and and just to sort of circle back to the comment about the coast and I mean the Navy cannot be anywhere else right we have we we need the, the international security hub of of our nation the Atlantic Fleet uh, for all the vessels need to be based uh, on the coast. So they can get out uh, and and um, and keep keep the world secure. So I think we're all interconnected and, and related when it comes to uh, this, you know, these big picture, long term uh, plans and exercises. So Stuart, if I can chime in here, I I know that. So the NCARS bill isn't prescriptive in the way that we will be assessing what the state of adaptation is or what needs to be done. What it is doing is saying that on a quadrennial basis, we need to take account of where we are and then take action. And this is something that is happening globally for folks who are familiar with the rules that are going on through the Paris Accord. You know, this is a stock take that all nations are being called to do. Um, this is like our own legislative vehicle for for um, our domestic approach to what is the state of risk and what is the state of adaptation and resilience. Um, I think that the working groups and the advisory groups that this bill is recommending to form, which also address FACA rules in them. So for the wonks out there who worry about that, you can find some fun FACA management components um, that, this bill is um, going to bring those voices from the local communities, from indigenous communities, uh, from the states, so that the way we assess and then recommend action is a reflection of what is already known. It won't be new people coming up with ideas about what should be adaptation or resilience who haven't, who haven't spoke to this or thought about it before. And then lastly, I just want to like kind of piggyback on what Spencer just said is, and, and I don't, I'm, I mean, I'm like, no, I won't say what I am or what I'm not, but like, we do have to attend to DOD's work as we promote this because Department of Defense has done an immense amount of adaptation and resilience work and it will serve us well in getting this passed 
and it'll probably serve us well in actually evaluating what is what is done and what could be do what could be done to make sure that all agencies are connecting and that's the power of the CRO to say across all agencies what have you done let's look at it holistically and not just leave it to each agency to run their own adaptation and resilience strategy and program yeah, and I think some of you will remember when we first started Resilience 21, we had a lot of conversations about whether or not we would put recommendations like these committees and tried to form them kind of in an ad hoc way. Um, uh, you know, uh, many of the folks uh, in, in R21, and myself included, sort of feeling like um, there was some PTSD from the, that wonky language that doesn't let you create these kinds of committees with outsiders and insiders mixing. Um, and yet that's what we really need, right? So there's, there is sort of clever, real, UC approved ways of doing this that show up in this bill and that's in the act and that's what's, that's pretty amazing. Um, somebody else had their hand up. I don't know if you, that was left over. Uh, Lori, you mentioned you wanted to throw something out there um, around funding and financing. Um, you put a, something in there about how we do this outside the federal government and keep the funding and financing flowing. Um, do you want to you want to bring that up now? How did we lose Lori? I can't see. There's enough people on the screen now. Um, Lucy, I know you had your hand up previously. Um, I was probably a question for the congressional aides, but I, 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 I did see you. So um, jump in there if there's something you want to add. Uh, well, I actually have sent you a follow-up email. It was mostly, um, one is whether there's any relationship with the National, the, the, uh, National Disaster Safety Board that's being, it's another bipartisan effort with Porter and Mace. Uh, is there any relation or? Um, it's a great question. And, and it came up yesterday in a call with folks that are overlapping with this crew, but we haven't all quite come together. So there's that, there's the Storm Act, there's the Resilient America, and then there's what's called the CEDARS, which is the Resilience Zones Act. Um, all of those are the most resilience focused kind of like elements that we've ever seen. Um, and they're not necessarily aligned. Um, NCARS is kind of top-down structure with the reporting, as Beth has noted, the federal chief resilience officer and kind of a federal version of what Kyle described as the role of the CRO in the, in the office, kind of working down and then the sort of reporting and the interagency work. So that board, plus some of the stuff that's in the CEDARS and creating these resilience zones that are the most vulnerable um, and putting funding towards them, it does start to have an overlap because that's how the, that's the how that we've talked about many times on these calls um, that, the, that the agencies have to worry about, that we worry about, right? That's my biggest worry. There's a lot of good what out there now and more of it right. coming, it's the how. So the board actually, to, the, to my point, is one of those places where there should be an overlap if we start to create those committees. Um, Beth, I don't know if you want anything more to that because I saw you nodding. No, I agree with you. I think that um, this is a different kind of function than the Cedars or Storm. Oops. Oops. She went away, but but Lucy, I'll look at the email uh, after. And, and, and okay, follow, there's follow. a second question. I, I yeah. have a good relationship with Alex Padilla, who was specifically Norman called out. Congressional activities. Oops. Um, and what's the direct ask? He's on Homeland Security. This is the this is the great point, and and the 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 both what um, John Mark said, and also the specificity that Chris brought to this about the ability to go to these committee members. So what's important here is that this isn't going to stand alone. NCARS isn't going to stand alone, and it's going to go through these two committees, and it's likely to be attached. So if we work on it now, and Bia and others who are on those committees push this forward, we need to make them sort of like speed that process up so that when that authorization comes into play, this is sort of ready to go and they attach it, right? Um, that's the idea here. So if you have 
to all of you, if you have those close relationships and the names that, that he rattled off or you didn't catch it and you wanna know, and same with our other co-conveners here who are approaching it at the very grassroots level and then at the national level, please let us know because to Lucy's point, if you have that connection, that's super important because that's the committee angle that we need to focus on. And it's unusual because it's also tied to, to the military and the DOD. So um, that's why we wanted Kyle to be here tonight because of many places in the country, Norfolk is a great example of the threat and the opportunity. So, so if, there's a, if there's a written out detail on exactly what you want, I would appreciate getting it. Great, thanks. thanks. Um, for, like Forbes said in Anna too, we can get you those like local letters and then also the national sign on, but the local letter will have the kind of talking points okay. um, that we want you to hear or you to, to be saying to Padilla and the rest of them that are on those committees. Okay. Um, Beth, yeah, you crashed, um, you're back. Yeah, sorry about that. My short answer to that was, I think that this is at a different level than the Storm and the Cedars Act and, um, they're all important and exciting to have resilience actually in active legislative conversations. Great, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Any um, burning questions, thoughts, worries, um, opportunities? Um, and I'll turn it over to um, my good friends, Lori and Mahir to, for any other wrap up comments. Um, but this has been amazing. Thanks to all of you who've, who've hung with us for this hour and a half um, and a uh, special thanks to our respondents um, and the co-conveners. Um, it's been uh, a great hour and a half and I think we've, we've got really got room to run now. Um, and if you're interested in following up with us, please do because this group is gonna, is gonna stick together as well. So Jade, um, I'll connect with you separately about the Indian Collective piece um, and Indian Fund, um, but others that are um, coming from different, kind of coming from different angles, um, definitely get with us because we're going to try to really push um, the local and national level, levels letters out and kind of have those conversations at the various levels. Here and Lori, anything else? Yeah, I think, um, I guess the last thing I'd love to do is just give our co-conveners a quick, um, and it, Lucy's question teed it up perfectly. I think if we just want to reiterate what the, call to actions are from each co-convener and basically should just show again the different ways that we're all hitting this to collectively get this thing through um, in a bipartisan way. Um, I think, Stuart, you just mentioned, you know, it, it needs to pass th through these two committees. So look at the committee lists, see who represents your states, where either you live or you work, um, contact those folks for either co-sponsorship and just general support. Um, and then with that, I'll, I'll leave it to our co-conveners to kind of talk about the different ways, just to reiterate that, um, they're acting on this. Um, Beth, you want to start off? Yep. Happy to, um, just dropped in the link again, uh, or in the chat again, a link to how we can use your support to reach members of Congress. We're setting up opportunities to meet with congressional staff in, um, key states of, well, the key states are on that, so I won't repeat them again. Um, we're also providing support to write op-ed letters. So go ahead and follow those links. You can reach out to me directly via email if you want more wayfinding. Um, and I'll hand it over to the other co-conveners. Thanks everyone so much for being here and for putting this on a potential to-do list. And I hope uh, to on a list of things that have been done. I'll be really quick. So the Union of Concerned Scientists is kind of supporting all of these other efforts, Resilience 21 that uh, is convening, but we'll be sending out an action alert to our members and supporters. We have a, over 500,000 uh, members and supporters asking them to uh, reach out to their Senator for signing on to the bill. So the action alert will educate folks on the bill and ask them to get in touch with their Senator to co-sponsor the bill. Awesome. Forbes? Yeah. yeah. And uh, just to rehash on Pew side of things, we've got a local support letter uh, and we'd love to have as many folks interested sign on uh, that we can then take that letter in our Hill meetings and demonstrate, you know, broad national support um, at the grass tops level. And then we'll have a, a national letter for any interested uh, organizations to sign on. Hopefully that'll be in the coming weeks. 
So uh, looking forward to sharing that as well. Awesome. And I think Stuart will uh, send out all that in a recap, right, to everyone who attended? Okay, great. Lori, any last words? Uh, just let's stay together, guys. Let's stay connected. Awesome. I love it. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, we'll post a bunch of stuff on the LinkedIn. Um, and as usual, because we recorded it, a lot of people asked for the recording. So we'll post that. Um, Lori's already promised to put like fake head on me and all kinds of things. <laughs> and Mahir and Stuart both it. did it. Um, <laughs> Mahir, thank you so much uh, for everything. And, and Stuart, for your emceeing of the, of the year. Thanks, Lori. Um, great to have all of you. Thanks again to our co-conveners and our respondents and um, for all the great work that you are doing on the ground um, and for the, the amazing partnerships we've all created. So let's carry this forward. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for organizing everything. This was great. Of course. Hey, Jim Murley. Thanks, Beth. Hey, Jim, good to see you again. I'd rather be in Miami, but it was good to see you on here as well. Cool. Lori's on the move already. Oh, Jim, it looks like you're talking, but you're muted. Well, I had to pick uh, Ezra. So it was really. No, I'm calling Stuart. Um, How are you? Thank you so much, everyone. It was great. Bye, y'all. Bye bye. bye. bye